pleasure, and let's please welcome Dr. Dan Keating. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. So I'm coming down from Michigan. I got on a plane from Detroit, got off the plane, and how delightful it was to be back in summer. Are you enjoying the weather here as much as I am? It's great. If you come from Minnesota, New Jersey, Michigan, you know what it's like. You walk out and that blast of cold hits you in the face this time of year. It's quite pleasant to go out and have this nice, warm, delightful shirt sleeve weather again for a few days. It's also great to be among you. I, I was thinking last night as Jenna was speaking, I said, you know, to myself, I said, you know, I, I really feel at home here with SPO. And then I sort of changed my way of saying it. I said, no, it, it's not just that I feel at home, I am at home. This really is a home for me. Coming <clears throat> yesterday, it's like a little bit of taste of heaven for me, seeing so many dear brothers and sisters, a few of whom go back really 35 years, but I know many of you much more recently than that. Seeing everyone, was really a great delight, and I'm, I'm really home here. And I was struck by Jenna's excellent teaching about the need for community as a requirement that we really need a people to be part of. So as Ryan mentioned, we're climbing another mountain. We're actually climbing the same mountain as yesterday. Jenna spoke about Mount Sinai when Moses and the people were there. I'm going to be speaking about Mount Horeb, but in fact, Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are the same mountain. It's a little confusing. Before I jump in, I just want to say one very quick word, though, about the kind of approach we're taking. We're approaching the scripture on this weekend, looking at the mountains of God, and we're ascending with the Lord. This is a very ancient tra and traditional way of reading the Bible. It's sometimes called popularly a moral reading, and by that, it isn't like about morality. It means that we place ourselves in the passage. We're not just looking at ancient history, we're not just looking at an example, but because this is the Word of God, we find ourselves in the Scripture itself. It's like the backdrop becomes Mount Horeb. We put ourselves there, and we hear God's Word. God's Word is living and active, and because that Word is always present and powerful, when we read it in this way, we ourselves are in the passage, we're being interpreted by the passage, and we're learning from it. And this is what we're doing here today and throughout the weekend. So, where are we? We're with Elijah on Mount Horeb. We need to catch up with him and where he was. Elijah has just scored a brilliant victory over the prophets of Baal. He was at a great high. Power and might came down from the sky. He was he was a star. He was at the highest point. And then Queen Jezebel strikes back. The empire struck, struck back and, and said to Elijah, the same will be done to you as you did to them. And Elijah is terrified and he runs away in fear. He goes from the highest to the lowest. And this is where we meet him in this passage uh, by himself, starting in 1 Kings 19, 4 to 8. Let's look at the scripture and allow it to speak to us and place us within it. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now, Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. You have to say this fast to get the right kind of complaining spirit. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones, a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat, else the journey will be too much for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So here's Elijah, devastated, discouraged, ready to quit, asking to die. And the Lord meets him with food and drink 
and a word, but the word is actually to move him to another place. It's very interesting. The Lord's going to speak to Elijah, but not there. He's going to move him to the mountain of God. Now, let's recall what happened at that mountain. It was that same mountain that the Lord spoke out of a burning bush to Moses. Out of fire, the Lord spoke powerfully. It's at that same mountain a little while later that he spoke in thunder, lightning, earthquake, fire, darkness, with a loud booming voice to the people of Israel, proclaiming himself and the commandments. So this mountain is a power mountain. And this is where he tells Elijah to go. And so we pick up the story in verse 9. And there he came to a cave. Let's assume that cave is on the mountain, maybe part way up, and he hides in the cave. And lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, you have to read this quickly, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and slain your prophets with a sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You can tell he rehearsed this. He's got his complaint fully worked out. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And you get the picture that Elijah is now at the mouth of the cave, ready to go out. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is a remarkable story. And the Lord is setting up both Elijah and he's setting us up, by the way, the readers. Why? We're expecting, we're at Mount Horeb, this is the power mountain. God's going to speak out of power and might. And the Lord kind of fakes it. Like, there comes the wind, but the Lord's word was not in the wind. There comes the earthquake and the fire, but the Lord's word was not in that earthquake and fire this time. Instead, after it all passes, a still small voice speaks. And what does it say? Does it reveal everything Elijah needs? No, it, it, it interrogates him. It asks a question again. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah then, we're not going to read that, rehearses his complaint, and the Lord corrects him and says, no, in fact, let's, let's just get this clear. You're not the only one who's left. You know, there are actually 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Don't, don't think you're the only star left on the show. So the Lord mildly corrects Elijah. He puts him in the right place, and then he gives him directions for things to come. Well, I want to ask now, if that's the story, is there wisdom here for hearing God's voice? What can we learn? Honestly, we could be here all day. You could give 25 presentations on what this passage means. I want to draw out three insights that I noticed. The first is very obvious. God doesn't always speak in the same way. We might be expecting a powerful blast of God's word, and he decides to speak in a still, small voice. We may be hoping for a quiet, still, small voice, and he speaks very powerfully. God is God, and he speaks in his own time in his own way. And this scene with Elijah is meant to teach the people of God, don't expect the Lord to come always in the same way. Don't expect him to come always with fire and lightning and wind and fire. But actually, maybe sometimes he will, because in fact, he does. So God doesn't always speak in the same way. I think some of us, we love the power. We love things with bells and whistles and fire and wind, and we'd like a show. We'd like God's word to be with trumpet blast, or else we won't believe it. But God may decide to come in a much more still, small voice. Others of us may say, 
deal gently, gently with me, Lord. I'd, I'd prefer just that little voice, and the Lord might decide to come in power. It's up to God. He'll speak in his own time, in his own way. Secondly, do you, know, do you notice what, what the Lord does with Elijah? He doesn't answer his question right away. He asks him a question in return. What's going on here? The Lord is drawing out what's in the heart of Elijah. He's dealing with the man before he speaks his word. And when I was going back over this presentation, you know, a lot of times when you, when you work up something, you hope everything in it is just really anointed, but oftentimes there are particular things you feel like there's a grace point here, or something that's really applicable, and I felt like this point was really applicable. Often we seek God because we want an answer to something. We want a resolution to suffering or a problem. We want the Lord to solve it. And the Lord will in his own time, but often he, he actually needs to deal with us first. He takes us from where we are and brings us to another place. He interrogates us and draws out our complaint. Oftentimes the Lord's answer to our prayer is to deal with us and then only afterward, in his own way and time, answer the questions that we have put to him. We need to be changed and adjusted in our thinking for God's plan to be fulfilled. I've seen this so many times in the lives of people, especially young men, seeking the Lord's word. They're trying to find an answer to what kind of life they should live, what vocation they should follow. And they don't just get this little tab that says, do this. God deals with them as they seek him and only after he's dealt with them, are they in a place to actually hear his word because now they're in the right place to hear it. I think this is a really crucial lesson from this encounter of the Lord with Elijah. Finally, my third point, even when God speaks a true word, we don't fully know what it means until it, it happens. Even when he speaks a true word, let's just say, okay, we know this is true. We don't know at that point, we don't have the word, we don't have the script. Okay, here's what the Lord has for you, fine. We still need to take that word and walk by faith. If you read ahead from where we stopped, what happens is the Lord says to Elijah, Elijah, I've got all these things for you to do. This is going to happen, you're going to do this, this, and this, this is what I've got. But you know, it doesn't work out very easily. It takes a long time, and in fact, if you read carefully, one of the things he says to Elijah only happens with Elisha, his successor. Elijah doesn't even see it. What's the point? Even when God speaks a true word that genuinely gives us direction, we still need to walk by faith. We don't have charge of that word. Now I've got it. Thank you, God. It's up to me now. The Lord still needs to unfold that word, and we need to walk in faith as we go. Well, I'd like to step back now and give some of my own experiences about this and, and relate to you uh, uh, two or three stories. We'll see how much time I've got on the clock. Where I've encountered the Lord's Word, I think it's helpful to put flesh on the bones here. The first uh, encounter happened when I was about 24 years old, give or take a year. I can't quite place the year. I was living on campus at the University of Michigan doing student mission work. And one of the things I did each Saturday morning at about 9 o'clock, I would <clears throat> walk from our house to the recreation building to play basketball. I was a very keen basketball player and liked to use it for evangelizing people, getting to know guys. But the back story is that from my very young, youngest years, <clears throat> I had a significant difficulty with asthma. And this was before the age of inhalers. Believe it or not, there were no quick inhalers when I was a boy. I'm, I'm a lot older than you think. Um, and so if, I, if, if the lungs got tight, I just had to wait a few hours for them to clear. And one of the worst things was running in cold weather. Yeah? If you have asthma, you know. I'm walking carefully, and I remembered I forgot my card to get in. Oh, no, you know, I'm going to be late. So I ran back to the house, and then I started running, and suddenly my lungs just tightened up. And, and now I became like Elijah. I didn't even realize what was in me. I started, I'm walking, I'm breathing heavily, I'm upset. And I go with this litany, you know, 
you know, I've had this thing from the time I was born, and I wasn't able to do that, and I couldn't do this, and I couldn't do I started rehearsing all my asthma troubles. I'm walking along rather angry. The picture you've got on, on, on the slide behind is, as I recall it, precisely the place I was when I heard the Lord's voice. I was in the middle of Washington Street because I remember I heard the Lord cut through my, my, my thoughts. And it was an internal word, and, and these were the words. Don't you know, don't you understand that this was my gift to you? I mean, it really came like a thunderbolt across my thoughts. I stopped dead in that street. It was Saturday morning, there wasn't much traffic. And I just stood there, stunned, and I, I, I remember just kind of stumbling back to the curb and just with my head down, just pondering. And of course, my response was, well, of course I didn't think this was your gift to me. Of course I didn't. And suddenly, I began reformatting my whole past and reading that history over again based on the Lord's word. And I saw this history of difficulty and I was allowed to see, I think, in the Lord's sight, this was a gift to me that helped keep me from harmful and, and distracting ways of going. And it's actually one of the things that's helped me be in the Lord so strongly. It's this asthma that I've had that God used to get me where he needed me to be. Wow. This, for me, was more like the burning bush. This was a striking, direct, intervening kind of word. Well, a second example. About 10 years later, I had come back from the United Kingdom where I had done university outreach, and I was now kind of leaving that work. I was in my early 30s and was earmarked for further study, which I was quite keen on doing. And it looked like I couldn't do that in Michigan, and so this just so happens, the next day I was planning to drive up to Minnesota, where I had set up interviews at St. Paul Seminary and St. John's Collegeville to see about entering their MA programs in theology. The day before I went, I was sitting in this coffee shop, which is actually only about a block away from where I got the previous word. And it was my sister's best friend, who was also a staffer working with the University Outreach. And there wasn't anybody to lead the outreach the next year, and she was really distraught, and she was talking about how they had this core of students, and isn't there someone who could lead it? And I, at one point, she fixed her eyes on me. It was like she just fixed me with her gaze and said, Dan, isn't there somebody who could lead us? <laughs> and really, it went right through me. It's like, ah. Oh. And I really felt like I heard God's voice saying, this is a word for you. And it, I didn't say anything to her, but I was really shook. That afternoon, I happened to go down to Sacred Heart Seminary only to find that they had recently opened up an MA program that I could start in, and I thought, oh my goodness. And I mentioned this to one of the other brothers, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm hearing God's voice. Maybe I should not go up to Minnesota to study, but stay here and, and, and lead UCO, the University Christian Outreach. And he then said to me, in fact, a whole bunch of us were hoping that you could do that, but no one wanted to ask you because we knew you were supposed to go study. And I said, good enough. I'm staying. Sorry, Minnesota. I never went up there to study. Oh. But, so, there's still time. Sam, if you can think of a degree I still need to get, you let me know. <laughs> In this case, I want to say, how did the Lord speak? He spoke through another person. I wasn't looking for it. I know this, this young lady. She wasn't setting me up. She's as pure as the driven snow. She wasn't manipulating me. She was just like, isn't there somebody who could? And I felt like, the, and so I stayed, and I, I led the work for six years. And I think a lot of good has come in terms of down the, down the road fruit from that. A final incident, I think I have time to just mention it briefly. The scene you see behind you is actually a scene from Maudlin College, Oxford. It's, it's a gorgeous avenue that C.S. Lewis used to walk, that I used to walk in his footsteps when I was there, um, where in fact one of his conversion points took place walking in this oval with J.R.R. Tolkien. 
when Tolkien and others helped him see something about God and it really moved him to faith. This is now a few years after this last incident, six years later, and I'm on deck to do further doctoral work somewhere, and I'm going to study with one of our brothers, and we had looked at a few places, and I simply had a conviction, an internal intuition. We're talking about options, and I said, you know, I think the Lord still has a place we haven't seen. He's got something for us that we just haven't seen. Just a conviction, quiet conviction. I said that aloud to a set of the brothers. Sure enough, a few weeks later, someone said, you know, you might write so-and-so at Oxford. He's there, and maybe, maybe, you know, it's kind of a crazy idea, but maybe something would open up. So I wrote him a handwritten letter, put it in the mail on Monday morning, and I got an email from him on Friday and said, Dear Dan, I got your letter. Come and study at Oxford. I can be your supervisor. Phone me in the morning. Oh my gosh. It turns out he had been praying to the Lord that the Lord would send people to study theology with him at Oxford. And there we are. The two of us went and I did three years at Oxford. Got to walk around C.S. Lewis's little place. How did the Lord lead in this case? Not by a, a word that intervened, not by someone saying it, but by a kind of internal conviction that he had something for us and, and so my eyes were open to see, and then the Lord opened that door strikingly. I'd like to wrap up my, my remarks here by giving a little conclusion and opening the door a little bit to God's guidance for us. First thing I want to say in summary is, let's allow the Lord to speak to us in His time, in His way, in the way that He wants to say it. We can't determine when and how God will speak, but we can keep our ears open and respond with faith when it comes. We can seek Him and seek Him honestly. Elijah, I give him credit, he went to the Lord and said and made his complaint, God can handle our complaints. In fact, He can work with them and speak to us and change us so that we can hear Him. Secondly, we listen for God's voice for ourselves but never by ourselves. As Jenna said last night, we're a community of people. Personal does not mean private. Hearing God for ourselves does not mean by ourselves as if I have to get it simply. We need the help of others. Sometimes they speak God's word to us, but they also are crucial for helping us discern whatever we receive. You know, I, I, I got this uh, conviction from this young woman, but I went and I brought it to others and they said, we were hoping you would do this. I go, wow, that's some confirmation for me. I had a conviction maybe there was some place to study, but the Lord had to open the door. I didn't know what it was until it opened. I also want to say we need the wider wisdom of the church. The wider wisdom of the church. Hello? Okay. That wisdom doesn't help us make concrete decisions. It doesn't tell us just what to do but it provides the wisdom and understanding of how God works, and it keeps us from taking misguided and unfaithful steps. So we have our brothers and sisters and the wider wisdom of the church. It's within that context that we hear the Lord and make our decisions. And, and this is a final point. I think it's important, brothers and sisters, not to narrow things to just hearing God's voice internally. God speaks through other ways than through his word directly to us, and I, I want to expand it as we, as we finish. His guidance comes to us in other ways. For example, our Father in heaven guides us often by circumstances, by opened and closed doors. We might want a word that comes right through the scripture. We're looking here, and in fact, a door closes and a door opens, and that's his guidance. He arranges things by his providence. Secondly, the Lord also shows us where we're going by what bears fruit. Fruit bearing is one of the ways we discern. In fact, for the most important decisions in life, a, a, a bare word is actually not a strong way of hearing, getting God's guidance. It's, it's a little bit too on its own. It needs strengthening. One of the most important ways we discern is by what bears fruit. I think this is especially true vocationally. 
We discern a vocation not because we, we pray and God says, get married. No, live in this community. It's not a bare word. It's being drawn to something and seeing the fruit that's born or not in a particular relationship, in a particular religious community, in a vocational calling. So I want to say to us as I, as I wrap up here, the Lord can speak to us in many and various ways. Let's be open to those ways. But he also guides us through circumstances, through other people, and through the fruit that he bears as we follow him as his disciples. By whatever means and through whatever kind of word we receive, we can be sure that our Father in heaven has good things in store for us. We need to walk by faith trusting in our Father. This is a crucial piece. We hear God's voice, but we need to hear with faith. I want to encourage us and say, you don't have to be, you don't have to have degrees after your name. You don't have to be a spiritual star to hear the voice of God. God can speak to you. He can speak to you. You can hear his voice. That's a great thing. Let's be open to hearing his voice and gaining the discernment of our community to understand and follow that voice. Even more than hearing his word, we can simply trust that he is our father, that our lives are safe in his hands, and that he will bring us to a good end. We really are called to an adventurous life. We are not given the script. Even when God speaks a word, we don't have the whole script. We've just got this little piece, and we follow by faith. There's an adventurous quality to our discipleship Let's embrace that great adventure and respond in wholehearted faith and devotion to the Lord. Thanks for listening and being such a, a welcoming group. God bless you.